Today we're going to discuss graphing exponential growth functions. So your essential question is how can I tell what the growth rate of an exponential growth function is? So first let's talk about what an exponential function is. An exponential function is a function in the form y equals a times b to the x power. So now x is our exponent. So that's basically how you can tell if something is an exponential function. Now you can tell that it's a growth function when b is greater than 1. So whenever this number in the equation that's attached to the exponent is greater than 1, then it's going to grow. Whatever b equals, that is the value of the growth factor in the equation. And you're going to need to know that because um, there will be several times um, in a problem with this where they will give you an equation they will say what is the growth factor. So you'll need to know how to find that. The percent in increase is the percentage above or below that 100% uh, the growth factor changes. So basically in this case because it's growing it would really only be above. Below would be for if there's a decay because it would actually decrease if it's below 100%. But if you're increasing something and you're multiplying it by something over 100%, then it's going to grow. Now the asymptote, which is usually an axis, like an x or a y axis, um, that a graph approach, approaches more and more closely but never actually touches. So you'll notice that when we start to graph these, um, when we plug in numbers, um, the graph is actually going to flatten out at a point and it's never going to get, it'll get really close to a number, a number but never actually touch it. And so that is called an asymptote. So um, we will get more into that when we're graphing, but you'll, just so you have the definition, it's here. So let's just jump right into graphing an exponential function. So here we have y equals one half times four to the x power power. So really the only way to graph these is to just make a table of values and plug in numbers for x. Now when you, um, when you plug this into your calculator you can plug it in exactly as you see the equation here. So we're going to have y equals one half times four to the negative second power first. And I generally plug in negative two to positive two for x just so that I'm plugging in negative and positive numbers to get an idea of what my graph looks like. So um, if we have four to the negative second power, um, that's actually going to be one over four squared, which would be one over 16. And if we multiply those, we would get one over 32. So um, I've already, plugged in these numbers for you, but I would still like you to um, take a minute and pause the video and enter these into your calculator and make sure that you're coming up with the same answers that I have. Because if not, I'll need to show you in class how to change that so you don't get these wrong on a quiz or a test. Um, so these would be the answers um, for if you plug in negative 2 to positive 2 for x. So we are going to graph these. Okay, so we're going to graph the points and draw a curve. I'm going to move this out of the way. So we have negative 2, 1 32nd. That's going to be really close to 0, but not actually touching it. Then we have negative 1, 1 8th. So I need to draw that on here. It's going to be a little higher, but not much. Then 0, one half would be a little higher than that. And then we have one, two, and two, eight. Now you can see it jumped pretty fast right there. That's because exponential growth is the fastest type of growth that there is in the world. Now if we were to keep going this direction and plug in more numbers like negative three, negative four, um, what you would notice is if I plugged in like 4 to the negative third power, what happens is um, we would get 1 half times 1 over 4 to the third power, which would be 1 over 64, which would equal 1 128. 
So you'll notice it keeps getting closer and closer to zero, but it never actually becomes zero, and it never becomes negative, because if I keep plugging in more negative numbers, it's just going to make this bottom number of my fraction get larger, which actually makes the number smaller and smaller and smaller, but it never actually touches zero. So um, right here, this question says, what is the asymptote of the graph? That would be y equals zero, or that's also known as the x-axis because this is going to keep getting closer and closer to zero but never actually touch it. So our graph kind of takes on this shape right here. It looks kind of like a banana. Now something I always like to do is um, when I figure out what the asymptote is, I kind of draw a dotted line across the graph right there. That way I know my graph cannot go beyond that point. So when I'm connecting my points, I can kind of have an idea of where that's going to be. So let's try another graphing situation. Now, um, you might notice that this looks kind of similar um, to um, the graphs that we just did um, with like cube root and square root functions. So um, if you look at this, the 4 right here, um, that number tells you how much um, it's going to stretch or compress. So if that number is greater than 1, this one is going to stretch by a factor of 4. Um, then this number up here in the exponent tells you if it goes right or left. Now remember, if you remember from last chapter, the minus actually means right. So it's kind of opposite of what you think it would be. So this one would go right 1, and then it would also go the minus 3 at the end means it would go down 3, because the number at the end tells you if it goes up or down. So since it's negative, it'll go down 3. Now, you can graph this um, a lot of different ways. Um, you can graph um, 4 times 2 to the x power, and then translate all the points right 1 and down 3, kind of like how we did our other graphs. But you can also just plug in numbers. And because you guys have scientific calculators, I would highly recommend just plugging in numbers for x and putting them in your calculator. Um, but if you'd like me to show you another way to do this, I can do that at another time. So I've already done this for you. Um, what I need you to do is pause the video and take a moment to plug in some of these numbers and make sure that you're coming up with the same answers that I have here. Um, now when you're plugging these into your calculator, you want to make sure that you put parentheses around the numbers in the exponents. Um, otherwise, you'll have to take negative 2 minus 1 to figure out what that is before. Okay, but you want to make sure this minus 3 is not inside the parentheses. So make sure that if you're having trouble with that on your calculator, that's probably what it is. Okay, so we're just going to graph these points. And we're also going to talk about domain and range. So um, on this one, we're going to graph negative 2, negative 2.5. Negative 1, negative 2, 0, negative 1, 1, 1, and 2, 5. Now remember, we kind of talked about um, asymptotes. So right here, what is the asymptote of the graph? If we look at this, it has minus 3 at the end, which means our whole graph, it usually would be at 0, but it's going to shift down 3. So y equals negative 3 is going to be the asymptote of our graph. So I'm going to go ahead and put a dotted line down here at y equals negative 3. That way we know, um, let me grease this a little bit, um, that our graph cannot go past this line. It's going to get really close to it but never actually touch it. So when I connect my points to make my banana shape, we're going to um, actually um, make it flatten out at y equals negative 3. Okay, um, now the domain. Remember, domain is what you can plug in for x. So if you look, we can plug in anything we want for x. There's no stipulations. There's not like any, 
any square roots or any x's in denominators. So this is going to be x can be um, all real numbers. Okay. For the range, when you look at the y-axis, if you're going up like this, the range is always going to be above your asymptote right here. So the range is always going to be y is greater than negative 3. Now, is it equal to negative 3? No, because it never actually touches this line. It gets really close to it. So your range is going to be what really matters on these. So y is greater than negative 3 is going to be um, your range because it's always greater than negative 3. So here is the famous exponential growth model. It's just an equation. Um, A is your initial amount. R is your growth rate, and that's always expressed as a decimal, so they'll usually give it to you as a percent, but you'll need to change it to a decimal. And then T is the time in years. So we're gonna take a minute to look at this example about computers. So in 1996, there were 2,573 computer viruses and other computer security incidents. During the next seven years, the number of incidents increased by about 92% each year. So we have to take a look at what some of our values are. So in this case, A is our initial amount, which we know is 2,573. R is our growth rate, which is 92%, so that would be 0.92 expressed as a decimal. And then um, we don't really know, like, it, T is like how many years you want to actually find it. So if I wanted to find out after five years, then I would plug in five for T. But this one says so just write an exponential growth model giving the number N incidents after T years in the incident. So we're trying to find what N equals. So we're really going to replace N with Y. Okay. So N is 2,573 times and then we have 1 plus r so 1 plus 0.92 raised to the t power and that's t years after 1996 because we don't know how many that is so that's our growth model okay then it says about how many incidents were there in 2003 now we're not going to plug in 2003 for t because that's not the number of years that's like the actual year so i need to figure out how many years um, after 1996 is 2003 so four more years would get us to the year 2000 and three more would get us to 2003 so t is seven because 2003 would be seven years after 1996. So now we're going to plug that in. So we have 2573 times 1.92 or 1 if we add these together to the seventh power. And all you have to do is plug that into your calculator and it will give you the answer. Now if you have a scientific calculator, as long as you use parentheses, you can figure that out pretty quickly. So I got about 247,485, if you round up to the nearest whole number, um, incidents. And we want to make sure we label our answer. And you don't want to have a decimal value of incidents, so we're just going to round it up to the next one. So that would be your answer. All right, the last thing we have to talk about is compound interest. And um, this is a formula that's used a lot. Um, P is going to be your principal, which is the amount of money that you invest. R is going to be your rate. And remember, that's expressed as a decimal, so you'll have to change it to a decimal when you plug it in. N is the number of times it's compounded. And that's kind of like per year. So if it says quarterly, you know, then you have to kind of think about what that means per year. Quarterly would be four times per year. Daily would be 365 times per year. Monthly would be 12 times per year. You kind of get the answer, um, get the idea there. Um, and T is the number of years. So we're going to use this formula. 
And we're going to try an example. Oh. So it says, you deposit $4,000 in an account that pays 2.92% annual interest. Find the balance after one year if the interest has compounded with the given frequency. So we have two problems here. We're going to find one where it's compounded quarterly and one where it's compounded daily. So remember, I, I told you quarterly would be like four times a year. And then daily would be 365 times per year. So you need to think about those things um, when you're plugging this in, is this is what you plug in for N, okay? So if we were to plug in these numbers, P would be the amount of money that we're investing, which would be $4,000. R is our rate, which is 2.92%, so we need to change that to a decimal. So that would be 0 0.0292. N is the number of times it's compounded. So for the first example, it's going to be four. And T is the number of years, which in this case it says is one year. So if we plug all those into the very first one, um, then this is what we would get. Now, you're going to have to work this out in your calculator. If you have a scientific calculator, you can plug everything in just as it is, as long as you use the parentheses. Um, I kind of like to work this part out first. Um, just so that I know what to plug in. So four times one would be four. So if we plug this into our calculator, um, I got um, about, when you work this out, you get about, if you just work out this part, you get about 1.0073, and again, I worked this out, it was already 4, and if you plug that into your calculator, you get about $4,118.09. Now remember, we're working with money, so you have to round to the nearest penny. If the number after this is a 5 or higher, you're going to round up. If not, you're going to round down because they're not going to pay you more money than they have to, even if it's just a penny or a fraction of a penny. Um, now for part B, it's going to be the exact same thing. The only thing that's going to change is we're going to change this number on bottom because remember N is on the bottom and then there's N up here. So N is the only value that's going to change, but it's going to change to 365 because we're compounding daily, which is 365 times per year. So you just plug this in, 365 times one is 365, and if you work out of this part in the parentheses, you get 1.00008, okay? And then you're going to um, work all of that part out in your calculator, and the answer would be $4,118.52. So you can see that with the same problem, the more times that it's compounded, the more money you make. Now, in a year, I didn't make that much more money um, than I did with the first one, but it's still more money, and it's free money, so um, you don't want to miss out on that. So the more times that it's compounded, the better off you are. All right, um, that's all I have for you, so please make sure you go back to the essential question and write your summary.